The thing that was funniest about Quibi was Quibi. Who was the original hater? Who said it would be DOA? Dunno, dunno, let's find out. Supposedly Quibi only converted about 9% of its free trial membership uh, to actual subscriptions. So Quibi is, uh, and I predicted this, would be dead on arrival. Also, I said Snap would decline in value. Their stock is up 28% on an earnings beat. But anyways, congratulations to them. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the DOJ appears to have arisen from a decades-long slumber and has sued Google for antitrust. While this should not have taken this long, it's better late than never. Actually, no, it's just uber fucking late. But anyways, anyways, it may be a sign of a broader change that's underway in the economy, government, and society at large. Key to progress is conflict and debate. There are three tensions across opposing forces that have propelled America forward. Capital versus labor, fact versus fiction, and government versus private enterprise. However, things can become out of balance, a disturbance in the force, if you will, if things become too lopsided. If Yin kicks the shit out of Yang and Feng knocks out Shui, the ecosystem becomes less robust and susceptible to invading species. In this case, the Burmese pythons introduced to the business Everglades are big tech. The DOJ has moved this week may signal that our society's immune response is kicking in to restore balance to the ecosystem. First, let's look at capital and labor. For almost half a century, capital has been beating the shit out of labor. Most American households feel poor, and they are. Since 1970, the share of national income represented by wages, salaries, and benefits, the labor share, has declined 16%. The inflation-adjusted minimum wage peaked in 1968 at $11.55, but today registers at $7.25. That decline in minimum wage translates to a 10% decline from 1971 to 2018 in the number of adults in the middle class. Also, we've gutted another platform for labor, unions, who have seen membership cut in half from 20% of workers to just above 10% in the last 40 years. Post-World War II, a collective goal was to grow the middle class, and corporate America was tasked with being an agent of this mission. And prior to 1970, productivity and compensation moved in tandem. However, in the backdrop of slowing economic growth and rising inflation, the shareholder class, who had endured anemic returns, demanded more of the spoils. From 1972, worker compensation became decoupled from worker productivity, with productivity increasing 246%, while hourly compensation rose less than half that. But labor's loss is capital's gain. The S&P 500 has been roaring, up almost six-fold since 1970, causing the wealth gap to rise as the wealthiest 1% own 50% of the stock market, while the bottom 50% own one-quarter of a percent. Today, the top 0.1% own as much wealth as the bottom 90%. The rise in wealth inequality has brought us to an inflection point, and companies are starting to respond by thinking beyond their balance sheet. COVID and its economic impacts have increased the focus on social injustice, and with it, the willingness of some CEOs to address these social issues. This year, Walmart pledged $100 million for a new racial equity center, while Warner Music and Sony Music each announced $100 million for social justice funds. Investors are also demanding change. BlackRock, the largest fund manager in the world, is planning to deploy $1 trillion into ESG investments over the next 10 years, forcing companies to change their behavior. Prediction. Expect companies to change labor policies to better position themselves for the trillion-dollar reallocation of capital that favors stakeholders versus just shareholders. However, however, this is just a band-aid and doesn't offer a long-term solution. Private companies are private and will prioritize earnings, hoping companies or billionaires will bail us out and solve what ails us is a symptom of a bigger problem, that our society and the sum of our views on policy as reflected by government and its spending is failing if third parties need to step in. Yeah, I can perform CPR, but we need hospitals and publicly funded universities to train cardiologists. 
The second tension, fact versus fiction. Since Socrates, we've put the pursuit of truth above all else. American journalist Walter Lippmann said in 1920, there can be no higher law in journalism than to tell the truth and shame the devil. We're now experiencing peak lunacy, where public lying has become so endemic and routine that fiction dominates facts, so much so that Trump openly says that Biden will, open quote, listen to the scientists if elected as if that were a bad thing. He's gonna lock down, this guy wants to lock down. He'll listen to the scientists. If I listen totally to the scientists, we would like Most media outlets would adhere to a code of ethics that included principles of truthfulness, accuracy, objectivity, impartiality, fairness, and public accountability. Opinions were clearly identified as such and politely debated. Many media outlets are now in the business of blurring the distinction between truth and falsehood, creating a fog of plausibility to seduce audience attention. But the fog usually, usually, cleared under scrutiny. But the real catalyst for the mass escalation of fiction, you guessed it, social media. MIT research reveals that lies spread six times faster than truth on viral platforms, while false news stories are 70% more likely to be retweeted than true stories. The bottom line is horseshit is just more novel and more interesting and more affordable on social media. Algorithms which are indifferent to the truth and just reward enragement, which leads to engagement, help turn fiction to fact, like Jesus turned water to wine. By the way, it was not wine. It was a fairly pedestrian Mesopotamian Cabernet. Anyway, anyway, if somebody could do the following, if someone could do the following, I would follow them, put on Nikes, and drink cyanide. Who would the dog follow? Who would he run with? Anyone that can turn water into Zacapa. That's right, that's how the dog rolls. By the way, whenever I bring up my affinity for the brown gold, people start emailing me and DMing me saying, I'm worried, I'm worried about your substance abuse. Well, let me tell you, let me put this to rest. I only drink virgin Zacapa and Cokes. What is a virgin Zacapa and Coke? It is when you take the magic rum, a little Zacapa, a little Coke, a lot of ice, some crushed lemons, and you don't put your dick in it into the drink. Too much? Okay. Anyway, anyway, you can feed the rage machine an opinion, and the algorithms will be sure to find a cult of Redditors who make it gospel. Only one in four Americans is able to accurately distinguish statements of fact from opinion. So it's not surprising that 42% of people believe any news they're consuming on social media is accurate. So it becomes a gross tonnage game. And the stuff you get the mostest is usually just crazy town. About a quarter of U.S. adults get their news from YouTube, and almost as many go to the site for opinions as they do for facts. At the same time, YouTube uses its attention-maximizing algorithm to recommend wild conspiracy theories to unwitting viewers, suggesting Alex Jones videos over 15 billion times, more than the traffic of BBC, The New York Times, Washington Post, and The Guardian combined. Yeah, YouTube's doing just great work. Again, the DOJ's attempt to rein in big tech supremacy and put our idolatry of the innovator class in check is another signal that this tension may be shifting. The final tension, government and private enterprise. In 1961, we allocated $26 billion to the Apollo program. Ironically, Google's R&D budget for a single year is $26 billion. We had, or used to have, faith in government agencies to get us to the moon. But now we turn to Elon Musk to get us to Mars. We used to trust the CDC to deliver vaccines. Now we turn to Big Pharma. Instead of the government treating our ailing democracy, we turn to the Zuck who commits to Congress he'll cure the disease he's created. In times of crisis, we now look to billionaire philanthropy over government rationality. But we wouldn't need to if we demanded a government that replaced billionaires' opinions with their money, and they simply paid their fair share of taxes. I don't really give a flying fuck what Zuckerberg thinks about education or Bezos' take on poverty. Americans want and deserve great publicly funded schools and low-income housing. Corporate taxes have declined from over 50% in the 1960s to just 21% today. The wealthiest 400 families had an overall tax rate of 70% in the 50s, 
But that has declined to 23% in 2018, with this cohort now paying a lower tax rate than the working class for the first time in U.S. history. But the Google lawsuit, the Google lawsuit is evidence that we may, may have reached a peak, peak private enterprise. The public are tired of a few companies dominating and controlling the surface area of economic opportunity, and our immune response is beginning to kick in. The vaccination for the inequity virus is simple. This vaccination has already been distributed to 32 million Americans and has proven nearly 100% effective. What is the knockout drug? Simple, voting. We leave you with a TikTok video highlighting a building block of this immune response. And y'all need to go on on to get y'all just, they could stand out there for 15 hours. I got my chair. They could stand out there for 24 hours. I got my snacks. I ain't going to play with these hoes. I'm going to vote. And I said, you go vote too. We'll see you next week.